So I'm here with Stu Schmill, Dean of Admissions at MIT. Thanks for joining me. Sure, happy to, Sal. So, so what I wanted to ask you about is, is just the general notion of, well, of course, college admissions. But in, in particular, you know, there tends to be some stereotypes in terms of what makes a, a competitive applicant. And I'll just throw out at least my stereotype of uh, you take, I don't know, uh, five, six AP courses and you do really well on them. You have a very high SAT score. Uh, your GPA is near perfect. You're, you're close to the top of your class. Uh, you ha you're, you know, you're vice president or president of uh, three or four cla uh, uh, clubs. Uh, you, you know, you're, you play uh, first viola in the symphony or whatever, whatever yeah. it might be. Um, all of those, yeah. All, all of those. So, so how much truth is that? Is there to that, and and or, or not? So I think uh, the things that you've just described are components uh, that a certain student might have uh, as part of their application. And it is not the, uh, the first way that we think about evaluating students. So we think about trying to enroll students that are going to succeed academically on our campuses, who are going to be uh, well matched to our institution so that the kinds of things that uh, motivate those students, uh, that get them excited, are the things and the culture on our campus. And then we think about what kind of contributions that those students might be able to make to our campuses, uh, which might mean uh, any particular kinds of uh, uh, talent that they have, but also how engaged they're going to be in the life of the university. So that's really the lens that we're looking through. And students can manifest those things and demonstrate those things in different ways. So uh, you talked about the number of cl uh, AP classes and, and things like that that students might have. And, you know, for us, we're looking at uh, the choices that students have made around their academics, but also their non-academics. So academically, we want to see that students are challenging themselves uh, in the things that really interest them. And students can do that in any number of different ways. Um, so AP classes may be one, but there are other ways of doing that as well. And, and not all students have, have even access to AP classes. Um, and it, it's not as though there's a particular tally or score sheet that we have where we're looking at a, a student's uh, record and saying they have to have certain markers. Because really, there are all different kinds of markers, all different ways that students can demonstrate these different talents. So certainly, uh, uh, academically, uh, as I said earlier, not all students have access to taking AP classes. So there may be other ways that students can demonstrate to us that academically they're going to be ready to uh, succeed on our campus. So there are these uh, two realities. On, on one extreme, you have, and this is maybe the more traditional reality, a student's taking a lot of very rigorous courses, doing a lot of homework, staying until 2 in the morning. Uh, they're very stressed out. They, they, they frankly don't have time to pursue uh, their passions. On, on the other side, you could have students who aren't in a traditional uh, system maybe, uh, and maybe they don't even have traditional grades, but they're able to show evidence of their academic knowledge uh, through standardized tests, through um, maybe they take things like the, the AP tests themselves, maybe they independent study for it, uh, maybe they take some college courses, uh, but they have more time to pursue their passions and build portfolios. I mean, on some levels, based on what I'm hearing, it sounds like that second student might even be a, at an advantage. I think students that are uh, overloading themselves, their coursework, where they don't leave any time for anything else, are definitely doing themselves a disservice. I think students, again, challenge themselves in the areas that interest them. But I think students also really need to leave themselves time and capacity to pursue more independent projects. Independent, I don't mean uh, by themselves. Independent projects could mean with other people, certainly. But these other projects that allow students to uh, use some creativity and uh, independent thought and coming up with some new and interesting things in whatever topics interest them. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we also really like to see uh, students submit as part of their application. We really like to see it, and 
those kinds of projects can really help students because um, it can show that it can show us kinds of things that students might want to pursue once they come to campus. And so on the academic side, really, we're just looking for evidence that students are talented and capable and that they're going to do well. And beyond that, uh, we're looking at uh, the rest of it and, I, and those uh, in the, the portfolios that students can submit uh, showing the independent work that they've done can really enhance their applications. So the student, you know, just to make it concrete, a student with strong SAT scores, the ones that would show or ACT scores that show evidence that they would do well at a place like MIT, strong maybe AP scores and, and, and the rigorous ones that they that they have an interest in, uh, plus a portfolio of things that they've, you know, substantive things that they've done, not just kind of cookbook projects, but things that were really uh, uh, show their passions, uh, they would have a, a, a strong application. Um, those students uh, would have a very strong application. So, I mean, that brings up another interesting dimension. I mean, at the at the other extreme end of this, you do have uh, some homeschool students. You have this unschooling movement. But how do you evaluate those students and actually even compare them relative to the students who are taking the five AP classes at a traditional college prep school? Right. So I think thinking about homeschool students is a great, um, a great uh, way to demonstrate the fact that it's not just about the AP classes. Because we have uh, homeschool students uh, who are very successful uh, and who do successful in our process, certainly, but also become very successful once at MIT. Uh, we do need evidence, though, that they're going to do well. And there are a number of ways that students can demonstrate that to us. Um, it is one of the reasons why uh, we require standardized tests. I mean, that's one uh, piece of information. It's not all of it, but it's one. Um, some students, right, who are not in traditional schooling uh, pathways uh, will still take uh, classes um, in less traditional ways. So some will take classes at local colleges, for example, and be able to demonstrate their ability that way. Um, and, you know, then there are other various kinds of, uh, of ways students can do it. Uh, for example, uh, the American Math Competition offers these uh, competitions where students who have a high ability in math can can do well on these exams and progress towards and through the Olympiad uh, program and it's a way for students to demonstrate again their talents at least in math so that's one example and there are other ways like that so we, we, we're open to evaluating all kinds of evidence that students can present to us to demonstrate their uh, ability to succeed once they come here yeah well, thank you. I think that this is uh, really exciting. I think I have some young people I need to call and tell them, tell them about this. <laughs> That's great. Send them our way. <laughs> Very good. Cool.